The jazz has stopped, and I'm happy to welcome you to this afternoon's uh, panel. Um, the topic today is, is, a, is, a, is a big one. It's a, uh, globalization, retreat, or reinvention. I welcome all of you here in the room, as well as everyone who is joining online on TopLink and on Politico. Um, my name is Matt Kaminsky. I'm the global editor of, of Politico. I have a terrific um, group here today uh, to address this question. Um, so as you may have heard, um, the, the theme of, of this year's Davos is Globalization 4.0. Um, and it struck me in thinking about this before the session that you could really kind of see this in one of two quite contrasting ways. The first one is things have never been better for globalization. Um, we are more prosperous. We are, the world is more peaceful. Uh, unemployments are at record lows across uh, developed countries. Uh, growth is at records in the developing world. Um, we're more integrated culturally uh, than, than ever before. Um, and at the same time, this panel could be called, and the theme of Davos could be anti-globalization 3.0. Um, you think of the interwar period, you think of the spasms around uh, the pre-9-11 period in, in, in Genoa and in Gothenburg and Seattle of the anti-globalization movement, and you think of our current politics. Um, we have Brexit. We have the first President of the United States, who is openly protectionist, at least in, in open memory. We have populist movements on the rise in France now, across Europe, in parts of Asia as well, Brazil. Um, and we are seriously uh, thinking about the future of the EU, one of the great uh, institutions that has helped bring the, at least uh, that trading bloc closer together, of the WTO as well. Um, so the question here is, uh, what's really going on and, and what is to be done? Uh, with your help in the audience and with this great panel, we have one hour to answer it. And um, I really want to begin with Frank Apple. Um, I think it's Appel, I guess, uh, in, in whatever you prefer, um, who's been the CEO of uh, Deutsche Post DHL for the last 10 years and whose business literally depends on, on globalization. I think three quarters of your business is outside of um, of Germany, um, and if cross-border trade and ties don't thrive, I'm sure DHL won't do particularly well. Earlier this morning, you were on CNBC, and, and you said, globalization is not on the retreat. Uh, just keep going on. Tell us why you're so optimistic. It seems a bit out of uh, tune in. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm not really optimistic. By the way, we are not only benefiting, we are enabling uh, globalization as a company, uh, and we are very proud of that. Um, so we, we measure every other year the progress along four dimensions. We call that DHL Connectedness Index. That's capital flow, information flow, people flow, and trade. And in 2017, all indicators were up. And in total, we had the most globalized planet ever. And in 2018, where we have not the final number yet, we have seen a continuation of uh, new free trade agreements uh, there is more voice around protectionism, and, and that is only one dimension of many. I think we have not stopped in 2018 for sure. People flow, capital flow, information flow, and even on trade, I believe it went up and not down. So, you know, it's not optimism; it's just fact and figures, which are showing that the world becomes more global, and so fortunately so. So you're not one of these CEOs who, in this recent survey that Price Waterhouse did, uh, is thinks the growth will decline and that prospects for your company and for the world economy are going down. So we have never been so uh, you know, overwhelmingly optimistic nor pessimistic. You know, we expect still that the business will continue to grow next year. Um, there are no indicators. If I talk here, I see many people telling me, CEO saying, my company is doing extremely well, but outside, it might be different. <laughs> So if that's consistent, you know, then the economic situation is pretty still very strong, I believe. What explains the disconnect between the politics and the economy? You know, there is, you know, it's maybe not the politics, it's also the population uh, which believes, uh, and, you know, and that's tricky where it comes from, that they are not benefiting from that. Um, and that's a part of a problem. It's also a part of a problem we are talking about reinvention. You know, interesting enough, there's also a split between the young and the elder people. The young still believe that globalization is going on and should continue to do, and elder people think that they are not benefiting. And, and that is a, probably a complex matter. Why is that happening? Of course, Brexit is, 
you know, if it's a hard Brexit, it's a disaster for the UK and Europe at the same time. Um, and, you know, you know, if it comes, we will muddle through that somehow. We will help our customers and, you know, mm -hmm. it, it will not as bad as people might think. Um, uh, but it's not good in, in any case. Sabine keller Busin, I'm uh, you are the COO of, of UBS, uh, one of the great financial institutions of, of this country and, and the world. Now, um, a lot of the political retreat on globalization, uh, if we just acknowledge that there is a political retreat and there are these forces, uh, people say is rooted in the global financial crisis of uh, 2008 and, and is being kind of so now. Um, I wonder to what degree, and you come obviously from the financial industry, is the financial sector part of the problem, and, and maybe perhaps how can it become part of the, the solution? I mean, what we have to see uh, from a financial perspective, obviously, um, we are now, I would say, globally and uh, UBS as well, we are organized in a way which is uh, made to survive a next potential crisis. So we have all these regulatory requirements like building intermediate uh, uh, company holdings in certain regions, which is uh, um, allocating capital uh, in the right way. So um, I think there is this, in, in our industry, there's definitely um, a divergence in regulations um, and there's a strong push for regionalization, even nationalization of, of uh, um, as I said, capital um, and, and um, this definitely is an outcome um, coming out of the crisis. However, I think um, looking into, uh, and, and I'm with you, I think currently the economy is doing well. However, I believe we see some scenarios with Brexit, with this uh, um, China and, and US polarization. We see tendency, we see it in, in countries as well where there's national discontent with, uh, and, you know, extremists uh, um, becoming, becoming more prominent and pushing for national solutions. I think the danger in the way that uh, um, if you're just set up for, for, let's say, for resolvability or crisis, that in times when the economy needs certain areas where you should allocate financial mm -hmm. resources, we kind of park them not in a productive way. So that is something I think we all need to be aware of and, and uh, um, have a view. How, how likely uh, from not at all to, to vary uh, that within five years we're going to see one of the big banks broken up by a Prime Minister Corbyn or a President Warren? I cannot envision such a scenario because... So not likely? Huh? Not, not likely? Not, not, in, in my view, yeah, yeah. Not, not likely. Definitely not. I do think that the financial industry has made a lot of progress, uh, as I said, and it came as a cost. I mean, um, if I'm just looking at my institute, it's just the legal entity build out was 1.5 million. It's just having the daughters and it's not maintaining them. So. I think we have invested a lot, uh, but as I said, is, is, uh, if, if I would have a wish, obviously I would love to get our uh, financial means and capital allocated to those areas uh, where I can, can invest more in growth, can invest more in these economies, support them, instead of holding them in, I would say, mature economies, uh, preparing for the worst. Right. So part of this political shift, I mean, seems really driven by political developments in, in the U.S. Um, now, Rick Simons, you are not a member of the Trump administration, uh, uh, but, I, but I would sort of like to, uh, as a resident and a citizen of the U.S. and, and someone who worked uh, in a senior policy role in the Clinton White House on, on international economics, to try and shed some light of, of um, um, what's, what's behind this turn in the U.S. And, and I guess more pertinently for us here, how permanent is it, uh, 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 this kind of protectionist populist both on the right and the left in, in America. And it's not just Trump, I think it's worth remembering. I think you're right. I think the, it would be a mistake just to look at the surface of this and all the smoke and fire of the rhetoric. There's actually something more structural going on, both in the economy and, and, and in the politics uh, on this issue. And you know, for the US, and let, again, I, I do emphasize, I, I don't pretend or, or presume to speak for the current administration. But I do think what I'm about to say, uh, there's quite a bit of agreement on across the political spectrum in the U.S. And, and that's the following, that the U.S. was instrumental, uh, clearly, in helping to build the basic policy architecture for, for the rules that we have uh, currently and create the institutions, including the WTO. But over those decades, it was clearly an economic hegemon and locomotive for the world economy. And there was a, there was a national security reason why the U.S 
would, would lead in that regard and, um, and in many cases be happy to have a deeper level of liberalization than other countries who were developing, both to support the first reconstruction and political stabilization in Europe and then uh, East Asia and the rest of the world. Now, fast forward to today, there is a, a fairly widespread feeling in the US, and you can agree or not agree with the, the, the premises of this, that there have been some major structural changes since then. First, there are a large number of countries, including many middle income emerging market countries that are highly competitive in, in key tradable goods sectors of the world economy, but their tariff levels in many cases, and you, you've seen the Trump administration hit this very hard, are significantly higher than the US. And they're, they're now uh, developing quite good living standards, certainly advanced OECD countries, but even many emerging market countries. And so there's a, a basic question as to whether that initial bargain that was created over those initial decades is still valid, particularly given what's going on domestically in the US. Secondly, is that we, we've had a different uh, the um, market economy models, put it that way, develop. Some of them are more planned and have a larger role for the state in them. And there are both reasons there of industrial policy that don't quite sync up with the original American conception uh, that underlied why we created all these rules. And the rules don't directly address them. Uh, and then there are more informal ways of managing trade or encouraging industrial development in key technology sectors, again, that don't fit that, that conceptual system of the way you run a market economy. Here again, there's a feeling that we need to modernize the rules to address that in order to maintain a fairness, a basic fairness. And I would, I would submit to you that uh, there's not wide agreement on the tactics and the rhetorics being used in the United States in this regard by any stretch of the imagination by the Trump administration. But I think those two structural changes, there's a deep appreciation of, and I think even if you had a Democratic uh, president elected, you would find a fair degree of consistency in some of the policy uh, positions on these items. Since in America we start our, uh, sadly, uh, but good for my business, uh, we start our campaigns for president about two years in, a, in advance. Um, how prominent a role do you think trade will play in this 2020 campaign? And where do you see the Democratic Party, I think we know when, when President Trump is on this, where do you see the Democratic Party ending up on, on these questions? You know, I personally think both for the US and many, many other countries, the fundamental issue here that's uh, roiling the politics is not trade policy per se. It's the relative weakness of key areas of domestic policy that countries have lagged on, particularly relating to investment in people and understanding that policy liberalization accelerates the degree of change and churn in the economy uh, in the same way that technology does. And, te and this is the other dimension, of course, for trade. Is that, and that, I think, for economic policy in many countries is over the years, and more, more so in my country than any other, underappreciated and underplanned for the human impact of that accelerated change in the economy. And that is that is a big part of the reason why we've, we've faced a drop in confidence in, the, in openness with respect to trade policy. And unless we address that element, I'm afraid we'll never get to building a better consensus in the US and maybe in some other countries as well behind an open <coughs> trading system. Bring in uh, James, Ar James Ariadi, who's uh, from a different part of the world, uh, based in Jakarta. Um, and um, you know, as all these surveys show that as we I guess we call the Western world is sort of worried about globalization and there's, especially in Europe, there's a strong turn against it. Asia, people in Asia are very positive about it. Um, and I wonder now that China has become the, the, the main boogeyman for the U.S. and you have the beginnings of what seems like a serious, uh, um, really sort of uh, uh, battle between Washington and, and Beijing over trade. Whether that, that might change. And, and, and are we headed for a world that's not just divided by ideology, but by different conceptions of uh, what, what the protocols for technology for, for, for trade will be? Uh, yes, everybody's watching uh, what's going on with uh, China and the US. But I think uh, uh, globalization is real. 
not just about ideas, about technology, but also about uh, human resources, uh, about money. I mean, it's no longer a medium of exchange. It's become a commodity uh, about the business. Uh, and I think globalization really have produced uh, significant wealth for the world and for Asia as goods are no longer produced uh, where the market is. Uh, but we've, we've already read a lot of the shortcomings uh, of all that. And I think as the issue now becomes uh, uh, real about, about what kind of new architecture it's needed, uh, I would like to say that uh, the focus has got to be on education. Uh, education around the world is determined by the market. The business world determines the content and the direction of education. Uh, and what they want is ready to use, link and match, ready to use. And I think arguably that is the core of all the problems today. That that kind of education that's been, uh, the, the architecture is, that's been produced by the business world have failed. <laughs> Uh, arguably, you can say that uh, for a lot of businesses, uh, new graduates need another nine months of preparation and training before they are ready to use. So maybe it's time to revisit uh, what education should be all about. Can I just stick on China a little bit, just a bit longer? I kind of wonder, you know, there is, I think what President Trump has done is sort of really sparked a debate that uh, hadn't been uh, 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 been quite quiet in, in in previous decades. That how can a rules-based uh, trade order survive if one of the biggest players in in that uh, trade order doesn't adhere by the rules? And I guess it's a question for for all of you. Uh, uh, but I want to start with you, James. Is is to what do you think Beijing might be rethinking its approach to? The WTO to to sort of trade um, will will this will Trump's strategy actually work potentially? Well, if you look at how much progress and wealth has been made from the from one side of the coin at least, uh, you would the business world would want another generation of peace, so that things get going. So you want some kind of orderliness and nobody nobody shouts and so on. But from the perspective of uh, this uh, of the U.S. Uh, they are more and more left behind, but not just the U.S. Actually, other countries are also left behind. So, uh, I think uh, uh, it's it's uh, it's time that a new architecture has got to be uh, has got to be uh, discussed. Yeah, but, but, but the question is: is even a hypothesis that this is all bad for the U.S. right in the first place? Because if you look into different dimensions, if you look into the influence of the American financial institutions of the global economy, if you see the technology companies, what they have as an impact on the global economy, um, you know, the, the power of a dollar system on the financial institutions and on many other aspects. So I would say in the U.S. has massive influence, you know, what is true is that there is a deficit in classical measure trade. But if you measure the outflow of what, you know, the high-tech high companies are doing with data, that is not in the same way accounted for like you measure inbound and outbound trade. Mm -hmm. So the hypothesis, I, 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 I doubt, is right, and that makes it so difficult to find the solutions. Why, why should China say, okay, fair enough, if I see all the other aspects which are, are, are present, and that makes it so complex. And the second is, what is the root cause why people even go for that in the first place? That is the loss, the, the, they fear that they lost control. And if you say retreat is good because that gives you control back, and that's somehow a part of a problem we face, I believe. Um, coming back to your question, so do we see, and I would say from the financial services industry, obviously China is a very attractive market with a sort of huge number of billionaires being produced uh, as we go by. However, it was, has been very difficult in, in banking in China as a non-Chinese uh, institution. And uh, so you could say in the past it has been really uh, uh, very, very uh, 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 asymmetric. It still is. But what we have seen is a, a softening for whatever reasons. Could be the push from the West. But what we have seen is now that you are allowed sort of having a majority stake. So uh, in, in financial institutions. 
And uh, that is just something where we see very, very slowly. It's, it's not fast enough. We see really this incremental move, but at least it's a move in, in um, I believe, in, in the right direction to a more globalized world versus the different solution where it's just the Chinese uh, um, using, using our markets. Yeah, I, I'm cautiously optimistic over the medium term that we will begin to reset things. And that as you just suggested, uh, we'll begin to see a better uh, zone of common ground among China and some of the economies that have a heavier role in the state in the economy, begin to address some of these technology, intellectual property, foreign investment, performance requirements, and other things that aren't really specifically covered by the rules multilaterally well, but that really do affect uh, investment and trade flows on the one hand. And the pressure that the U.S. is putting on is, is about leverage, is creating leverage to try to reset that discussion. It's a bit crude, in, you know, clearly in many ways, but, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a negotiation in some way. The second thing is, the other thing that needs to happen to reset and, and improve the architecture is to recognize what you just said, and that the nature of trade is, is really changing rapidly. The role of the digital economy and its importance for services and the importance of the, the role of data and how data is treated in many, many different uh, lines of, of work and how that affects the value chains. That is something, again, that the current rules multilaterally don't well address. They're better addressed in some regional context. But if we made some progress there, and we'll probably need some new kinds of architecture in this regard, then I think also that would help to build a renewed sense of common ground among the U.S., some of the other advanced countries, and indeed many emerging countries that, that are keen to, to, to take advantage of these new, new opportunities uh, that are technologically driven as well. The remaining issue will be developing countries which are, don't have strong sectors in this area. How do we make sure that that, uh, that development of the world economy more generally benefits uh, them and they're included as well? Can we save the WTO? And if so, how? Rick, it's for you. It's for me. Yeah. To, to, uh, I think um, the first uh, step, I would say, is in fact to try, uh, and this is something the WTO doesn't have real control over, is to hope that what, the first part of what I just said happens, and that there is, between the, you know, the, the two elephants uh, in, in the ring, that there is some accommodation uh, reached, uh, because that will help to, to lower the temperature and allow people to focus on strengthening the, I, the WTO. The second part of what I said is challenging for the WTO, because it requires for them in their current construct all 160 or so countries to agree on rules, in some of these new areas, particularly the treatment of data, uh, that is not feasible in the, in the medium term. But what the WTO could do is to provide, because it's the only institution that has the broad view uh, of the whole system, it could provide a place, maybe in cooperation with uh, informal platforms for dialogue like ours and others, an uh, opportunity for some bottom-up process to emerge on developing best practices that an increasing number of countries converge around and that create a, a kind of a new architecture in the new areas of the economy that eventually could come into the WTO. But I doubt that, it, I doubt that they could start there and, and get universal support for them. And if you, if you were sort of holding that magic wand and, and you could say, um, looking at other existing institutions or you want to create a wholly new institution that <clears throat> you think would be best placed to uh, ensure um, an order that uh, serves your company's interests or liberal values or what have you, what would it be? Maybe, um, Sabine, if I, thinking about sort of, is the Basel, is, is that sufficient enough to kind of provide the framework for the financial system or should we be pushing for Sarbanes-Oxley to become a global, global law? I, th I think we have, we have the right uh, groups and as you mentioned with Basel as well, I think it's more like uh, the way we, we all act, sort of. I think whoever is, is uh, in charge, be on the you know, uh, uh, side of the politician, politicians, the polit uh, political decision makers, but the same being part of industries. I think it's, it's acknowledging that we are at the moment, it's, it's, I wouldn't say tipping point, but we see these, these uh, tendencies. And I would rather sort of ensure that the existing bodies uh, people representing and are, uh, um, you know, members of re these bodies that we are stepping up and that we're doing the right and starting with our industry. I mean, we, need, we have an obligation as well to understand root causes and then 
invest, and I'm, I'm with you, I think, investing in education as, as you know, companies, investing in, in goods, and just making sure that, that we do the right thing for, for the economies, <coughs> but leveraging our existing bodies. I wouldn't create the super uh, uh, new uh, uh, group, I, I, I don't think. I think uh, we have, we have uh, the right... Um, Forums. Frank or James, if you were Merlin, what, what would you do? Uh, so, so, you know, first of all, you know, as I said already, I think people f are afraid somehow because they lost control. The reason why they feel is after the financial market that destroyed a lot of trust in business somehow uh, to a certain extent. And they said, oh, things are going on which we don't understand so much. We as business have not been very good in explaining what's going on, despite that we are probably the only institution who is really global. If I go into our company, who is 220 countries and territories, if you explain internally to the employees, to the shop floor level, careers, warehouse clerks, why things are as they are, they say, now I understand what you are saying. And then they say, and you even, I, I only saw the headlines, but the, the Edel, Edelman Trust Barometer obviously is up, in particular for the, my own employer which tells me that this is, we have to explain more. And that's mm -hmm. the reason why I believe business has to play a bigger role in the discussion again, in the G20 discussion, in WTO, because we are the only global institutions. Mm -hmm. For me, an employee in China is equally important as a German, an American. And I say that when I go around the world, you are equally important like the people in our head office in Bonn, in Germany, because, you know, you, we are running one customer promise. And that goes a long way for people. And they trust if you explain. And that, I think, we, and we have seen that. We are a family of people. And we have no conflicts between countries who are even in civil wars or something. Because they say we serve the same countries. What they do at home, I don't know. But then they work for the same company. They work very well together. And I think we have to play a bigger role. G20 is probably more promising because it's a smaller group, but if they rule the world, then the rest will follow because they are the power of the planet. And I think that is, you know, where their decisions that need to be taken. James, do you think it's more in the realm of intergovernmental organizations, the governments are, are part of the solution, or is it more actually in the in the private sector that that that, that has taken a bigger uh, role? For many years, uh, the U.S. have placed. Uh, priority uh, on uh, the issue of human rights, democracy around the world, and so on, uh, while the other countries are thinking about economic growth and competitive economic growth. And I think it's the U.S. now is realizing it's you know it's it's no longer about just democracy and human rights; it's also about the economy and economic growth and competitive. Uh, Positioning. So I think I think I think uh, I agree with Richard that on the one hand, uh, I'm quite optimistic that they will find uh, a way to settle things. Then the existing international institutions can can come in and play their role. But uh, knowing China, uh, they might take their time, uh, and so this would be a this would be a worry. Right. So I want to bring in the audience. Uh, um, uh, with uh, perspectives and sort of questions uh, in my head. Please think, think what uh, of yours. And before we go to the audience, I, I want to uh, do a little quiz um, uh, for all of you. It's, it's a one word answer. Um, uh, um, which force is going to change the world the most in the coming, uh, let's say, five to 10 years? I'll give you three, uh, four options. Uh, globalization, uh, technology, Climate change, or fill in the blank, and you actually have to fill in the blank. So, uh, um, so we want to start with you. I, I would bet on technology, including AI. AI, yeah. more than uh, quantum com computing. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, it's the new. Let's let's have two words: new technology. Technology, okay. None of them. My hope is youth, <laughs> the next generation. Youth, all right. I, I, I think the. What's the one word, I suppose? It's the, sh I'm not sure there's one word. There's a shift in uh, perceptions about how to balance the economy uh, to make it work better for a wider degree of people. I don't know what, how to summarize that in one word. But one word. Uh, one of the others. <laughs> the one word answer. I would say technology and all the discrepancies that it's creating. 
And technology a force for good or, or, or ill? For good. Good? For good. We all agree it's good? I, I would say you have to look at both sides of the coin. <laughs> yeah, right. Agreed. Because te te technology is propelling globalization, and, and we're talking about some of the negative aspects of, of globalization, too. But, but think of the health aspect. I mean, technology can, can alter health. If you're thinking technology in countries where you're not having a medical, uh, um, uh, how do you say this, you know, you're not, not, not enough doctors available. Right. You can use technology a lot and enable people. We've seen that, the, the village doctors and, and all these things. So I think uh, 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 pre-diagnostic of illnesses. So I think technology in its good, and it's not, I don't think it's the economic side only. I think it's the ability of technology, if it's deployed for the good side, that yeah. could do a lot of change. I was struck by um, what Tim Cook said recently, the, the CEO of Apple, of course, that he thinks Apple's future is in health. Mm -hmm. um, so those watches that sort of measure your heart, heart heartbeat. So don't be shy. Uh, please and introduce yourself. I'm advocating for farmers from India and the poorest, the developing world. We're talking about globalization, we're talking about WTO. Where does agriculture fit in? Because normally when you have trade disputes like between China and uh, America, you're talking about uh, trade deficits and things like that. But when you look at agriculture, you're talking about livelihoods. And I would want to see that how, how where, where do we see in the next 10, 20 years about how agriculture is going to be impacted with this globalization? Because millions and millions of people are impacted because of how WTO was signed and how it's got very grave implications. In fact, many farmers in the developing world actually cheered the US president when he said he's walking out of WTO. Who wants to address this? Rick, you want to give it a try? I mean, that's why I used the word rebalancing before, is I think we're going to have a kind of a rebalancing of priorities in, in, do, in domestic policy, but it'll affect trade as well. And one of them is in this area. You know, for 10, year, 10 15 years, people try to get a, um, a very liberal approach to agricultural trade done in negotiations, and that never succeeded. And I do think that things have shifted and people recognize that we need to rebalance a bit and understand the livelihoods question that you're talking about and that we need to have a bit more of a flexible and hybrid approach to allow countries uh, to maintain rural livelihoods while not you know, unduly discriminating and shutting off their markets. So we need to find a better uh, balance in that regard. Uh, you know, in, in the US, uh, I think uh, something like 5% of the population produce all the food for the people in China, it used to be 20, 30 years ago, it used to be 95% producing for 100%. Today, I think it's, it's only about 15%. Uh, and all of that is because of technology and all of that because of uh, globalization. So I think with globalization, if it is allowed to flourish without, without the pollution of politics and geopolitics and so on, a lot of good things can happen uh, in the agricultural sector. Uh, as an example, you know, there are so many direct flights from Thailand to Israel. And it is not without any reason. It's all this agricultural technology, and that's why Thailand has become, you know, a, a, this, a great uh, this agricultural uh, this, uh, country. On the other hand, I come from Indonesia. They would not allow to, to have even one flight to, to Israel. Uh, they would not even allow Indonesians to go to Israel. So you, you miss out on some of these things. I, I'm, I'm using extremes. So I think. Uh, the right kind of globaliz globalization should, al should allow benefits to flow through the agricultural sector. Yeah, and, and the point is, you know, there are never ever any agreements which last forever and they are right forever. So to ask for a level playing field is not wrong. The U.S. says we want to have a level playing field in certain areas, that's true, but other countries should ask the same. It's not, you know, the agreements are fitting to a certain purpose. Of course, uh, you know, then we started, <clears throat> the emerging countries you know, should gain more. China is not any longer an emerging country. It should not be treated as an emerging country. You know, that, that is changing, and therefore we need a discussion about that, how we rebalance certain things. And that's a completely you know, le legitimate uh, question to raise. You know? and I'm not saying you know, all the agreements we did 20 years ago, 15 years ago, or what, whatsoever, are always right forever. There's a question right here in, in front on the on the couch. 
Yes. Uh, hi, Alexander Stubb. I'm the former Prime Minister of Finland, currently with the European Investment Bank. Given that Matt did a multiple choice question, if you'd allow me, I'd <laughs> go for two uh, true or false um, <laughs> hypotheses. Uh, the first one is, um, do you think that the notion of multilateral trade agreements a la WTO are dead? And given that there is a clear power vacuum emerging with the withdrawal of the US from the trading nations, the lead is going to be taken by the European Union through bilateral trade agreements. Uh, so do you think the EU will be the trendsetter and the regulator through bilateral trade agreements? Question number one. Uh, question number two, uh, by necessity, do you think that the next level of cooperation between the United States and the European Union is actually going to be in the realm of the digital revolution? because of the way in which these two continents think about artificial intelligence and about privacy, which is really the opposite way in which things are looked upon in China. Uh, so my question is, do you think that the EU and the US will forge a merger on digitalization against China? Uh, and then the other one was, and final point, uh, Matt, you mentioned health. Uh, Apple is a little bit out of it. I'm wearing a Finnish ring called Aura, <laughs> which actually measures all of my vital signs in real time uh, and has an app uh, that goes through my pulse. Right now it's quite low, 46, so we're doing it okay. <laughs> I'm not an Apple shareholder, I just said this. Okay, I like quizzes. Who, who wants to start? You know what, I have a clear preference that we uh, re reinvent WTO, uh, multilateral, but if that doesn't work, then it's better to do bilaterals instead of doing nothing. So that would be my answer uh, on, on, the, on the first subject. Uh, the second point was, again, yeah, I, I think, you know, we have so much in common uh, in, in the US and, and Europe, and I think we, we should uh, strive to have one alignment, how we deal with data and how we protect privacy of individuals and you know just because we are on the short end some conflicts doesn't mean that we should not strive for getting a line on the long run. Let me say uh, I think uh, things started bilateral and then we expanded to multilateral uh, but I think uh, uh, it's, it's going to be combination. Uh, while it seems that from the US and China there seems to be some breakdown but other discussions and negotiations continue on. I think from a business perspective also, we see that uh, things before used to be so simple, just bilateral, it has become multilateral, but it's a combination of all that. So I, I would say that it will be a much more dynamic system. On the second issue, uh, uh, this, uh, on the technology digital side, it, it's all coming to, you know, the, 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 the competitions on the 5G. That's gonna, that's gonna impact life, it's gonna be impact the infrastructure for everything that happens over the next you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And it, the reality is it is starting to polarize uh, with the developing countries going maybe more EU, uh, EU and, uh, and, and the US and then the developing countries uh, into Huawei. Uh, so I think it, it, the reality is like that. A slightly different way of asking you, is the future clash between China and Europe slash the U.S. a military clash, a trade clash, or a technological rules clash? Future, he's punning that one to me. <laughs> but I, I, I don't just want to duck out this question either, so his two so or I, false. I think, I think there are elements of all that we're going to see, and that this is going to be the art of, of statesmanship. Uh, to manage this well, because we're so interdependent that to manage this in a clumsy way will be in everyone's, uh, will, will do harm to everyone. But on the WTO question, I think the WTO survival uh, depends on the WTO being able to embrace a more variable geometry than it's traditional, everybody's got to sign on the dotted line. Right now, the rules in the WTO are not very hospitable for groups of countries, even large groups of countries, to negotiate something as a forward group that then the rest of the, the organization can accede to later on. That, that needs uh, uh, to change. 
Uh, and then the second part is even in a more variable geometry world, there's still a really crucial role for the WTO, the multilateral system. There are currently 400 uh, preferential trade agreements, usually regional trade agreements. There are 3,000 plus investment treaties in the world. It's such a maze of different rules that companies operating globally, let alone small businesses that are trying to export into different markets, have to navigate. Nobody but the WTO could do a better job than beginning to stitch together better coherence among this patchwork quilt. And that's a future way for the WTO to renew and refresh its utility in the world. Last thing very quickly on the digital and the data. Um, EU, US, actually I think tomorrow we're gonna hear from the Japanese Prime Minister on his agenda for the G20 this year. And I, I believe you will hear a significant new uh, emphasis in this area. So I, I think the EU and the US can provide leadership, but I suspect it will not only come from those two. And I would, I would look for um, a larger coalition moving, maybe led by the Japanese, we'll see. Maybe if you allow, I would like to follow up on James. If James' hypothesis is right that we get two four, 5G networks, I don't, I don't know how we should run a global company any longer. You know, because one, one camp will say you have to operate on that network and the other one, and then how we exchange information. You know, I, you know, I can't imagine, if that really happens, mm. you know, I don't know how we should ship any of the high-tech products from China to the US and vice versa. With, you know, how should we manage the data? <laughs> you mm. know, is the data center then in China different or do we have to bring everything? And I, I you know, and, and that is a real problem. We have that already with data. Yeah. More and more countries are demanding that the data is only kept in the respective countries. And that is already a massive problem to manage. You know, we still deal with that. But if that really, if a technology is separated between two parts of the world, I have no imagination at currently how we should run a, run a global business, actually. Do you want to take on the true or false challenge? I think it's, it's difficult to add because I agree the, the WTO, uh, uh, I think that would be the frame that, that we would all wish uh, um, sort of stepping up. If I could push back at Alex Stubb uh, um, and, and put you on the spot for a minute, um, why do you think I guess you know, that's a true or false question about the U.S. and the EU coming together. But on current evidence, there, um, on antitrust, on taxation, on data privacy, uh, if anything, they're di diverging. You're, not, you're now seeing the backlash to technology in the U.S. that happened in Europe a lot earlier. But why do you, and that what I read to be the presumption of a question that they are destined to come together, why are you so sure of that? Because on current evidence, that doesn't seem so obvious to me. If you just get the, yeah, the, the mic back here, yeah. I, I think the starting point is linked to a belief in the individual and in privacy. If you look at the way in which people in Europe and even the United States reacted to the revelations on Cambridge Analytica and Facebook using the data. If you look at a lot of the legislation norms and discussions that are right now linked to privacy in general on both sides of the Atlantic, they're actually pretty close to each other. Yes, you're seeing a lot of competition policy being quite aggressive or antitrust as call in the US against some of the tech giants in the US but a lot of the tech giants are actually right now adapting themselves to the for instance general data protection directive and they're doing it not for Florence Nightingale type of stuff they're doing it because of competition and necessity on the other side you have China uh, which has a completely different approach, I would argue, to the individual and the notion of community and privacy. I'm not saying it's wrong or right, but it's very different. What we're seeing now with some of the technological applications determining your social status, whether it's through Alipay or others, you would never, ever see that uh, in the United States or in Europe. So by necessity, and by default, I think we will iron out some of the differences between the US and the EU, and to a certain extent, I'm simplifying, gang up 
uh, against the Chinese. So at the end of the day, it's going to be some of the uh, US-based tech giants from Facebook to Twitter to Amazon going against Tencent, uh, Alibaba, uh, and others. And this will be the big sort of technological battle. And I'm sure you will then see the Western world simplified uh, going a little bit against China. Uh, and, but that's why I really liked your point on not having two different 5G networks, because this could be a defining moment, moment as well. I'm, of course, exaggerating, but this would be my case. Yeah. And for the same reason, I think uh, uh, if the US and the EU gang up together, it will be a very hard fight. Because you've got different set of values in terms of privacy and data and so on in China versus uh, in, in, in the Western world. Yeah, final point on this. You know, I've, I've, I've wrote a Financial Times column a while back, slightly provocatively, for China, Europe is the new Africa. <laughs> and my argument was that if you looked at a lot of the acquisitions by Chinese companies, either known or unknown, linked to, for instance, uh, intellectual property and otherwise, Europeans just let it go. We didn't have a CFIUS dealing with this. And now you're starting to see a lot of the regulators, whether they're French or otherwise, starting to say that, hey, you know, Aikstron could have gone through the fingers. This would not have been a very good thing. So we're going to start seeing European regulators getting a little bit more aggressive, uh, I think, on this. Interesting enough. Yeah. So an interesting sort of political turn and maybe it's a funny way that I think Europeans would never admit it, but that sort of the um, Trump's sort of China bearish policy has seems to be rubbing off on, on Europe. But putting you, Frank, on the spot, you're sort of saying that if the future with 5G, that's China would be a separate <coughs> entity and would be opting out of globalization, arguably, or, or making it difficult. But aren't we, in digital terms, already there? I mean, China has its own digital ecosystem. It's got its own champions. Uh, um, mostly American giants can't really do business there. Um, isn't it already there, in a way? Yeah, but that, that's different because that's so far more consumer business anyway, and they, you know, that we have it in many in retail. And if you look into the classical retail, you know, there are many different companies around the world as well. The, the point is, if you really start connecting the dots, how you deal with data and how you deal with information exchange. And I think we need a new agreement globally with an umbrella in every country has its own right to interpret what is in addition applicable in the respective country. You know, because we have not everywhere the same government rules and that's the decision of the citizens of a respective country. So we need to find an agreement in you know, how we deal with that exchange in an environment that we have different governments. It's reality. And you know, we have no right to say as Western, everything has to be a democracy. That's, you know, we can't do that. We can strive for that we defend our democracy as Western countries, and we should. That's the reason why the US should be very well aligned with, with Europe. But we can't rule the world somehow with that. So we need an idea how we align with different systems mm -hmm. that we can still work together. Should we be bringing digital into the conversation about trade more uh, 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 um, aggressively in, in a sense? Uh, I mean, uh, and bringing kind of that we will need a set of, or presumably you will need a set of um, common, lowest common denominator perhaps, but sort of common digital rules uh, to make it, uh, and WTO might be a place, I don't know how realistic that is. Um, yeah. How, how how would that look even? Yeah. So there's 72 countries now that have agreed uh, to uh, begin discussing e-commerce e in the WTO. We don't know where that's going to head, but it's an important step uh, forward. The trick with e-commerce is that there are a lot of enabling environment uh, uh, issues that are not likely to be something you can have a harmonized global treaty about. They're more about you know, digital payment systems or uh, digital documentation or logistics, uh, facilitating logistics, a range of things where it's where you really need a public-private dialogue, and you need some best practice frameworks. Um, but probably the WTO will handle the principles part of it, kind of a basic level of trade principles, if you will. That's one part of it. The second part is what you just mentioned on the data side. It seems to me, I completely agree with your framework. Um, China has a big interest because it is not simply, those large companies are not selling simply domestically. 
they are global firms, and they have uh, keen equities, you know, large equities in expanding internationally. Uh, just as Western firms have a big interest in maintaining and expanding production in China. So there's a built-in, I think, common interest in coming up with a, a kind of framework that you just talked about, which is uh, can we define certain classes of data which ought to be allowed uh, universally to move because they're commercial, they're non-personal, or they're an anonymized personal data that enables big data services that benefit society. And then, as you suggest, Presumably there will be areas of policy that will differ by country because of their different cultural norms or different policy preferences that you have to allow for that kind of flexibility. But coming to at least that type of a, a two-tier or maybe more than two-tier arrangement of identifying a common set of different classes of data that can allow the world economy to be interoperable and operate increasingly as digital plays more of a role and data underlies much of the value chain that activity that's going on. That's essential, and uh, I think that's, as you suggest, it's got to be a high priority for, for the way we think about globalization and trade uh, policy going forward. Does anyone want to weigh in on this digital point or, um, or something related to it? Okay, I want to, in the time remaining, in, in the few minutes we have left, uh, one thing I was struck that you, my, my little quiz uh, question on which force is really going to change the world. Um, not even mention kind of climate change, which you hear about all the time. Uh, and and be curious to hear, hear sort of why. Why, um, how should we be thinking about kind of climate and the, the future of the world, certainly, but even the future of sort of globalization. Uh, it has impacts on migration flows. It, it, it uh, is, is shifting where um, we're gonna get our resources. It's certainly shifting what kind of resources we will consume. Um, um, so this is more of a, it's not a one word answer. Uh, uh, I wonder if someone would want to um, tackle this one. You know, may, may, I, may I start? So, so I think the, the, <laughs> the Paris Agreement was a breakthrough, I think, for the world. Um, you know, now the job is somehow to execute that and business have to do their own job. We have committed ourselves um, uh, two years ago to really uh, be carbon free, not carbon neutral, carbon free by 2050, despite that we are flying a lot of airplanes. We are generating now the demand. We have our own electric vans developed, which are already 9,000 on the, on the street. So I think that's not a fundamental problem. I'm from education, a chemist. So carbon dioxide and water is the base for you know, all, any nature. You know, plants are doing that on a big scale every day, on a mega scale. So you can reverse that problem if you find the right technology. And I'm very optimistic that we will find the right technology to cope with that problem. The problem is more the short end. What happens to islands? What happens to coast areas? What happens to changes in climate short term? The fundamental belief I have is that this is fixable because the plants are doing that on mega scale every day. Uh, with carbon dioxide and water. So that is not an unsolvable problem. It needs commitment from the governments, which we have. Now it needs commitments from the business to, to generate demand, and then we will find the right technologies to solve it. If there's no, I mean, I think uh, you put your finger on a really important new phase of global economic integration and policy. The Paris Agreement, in order for it to succeed, we have to think beyond it and build upon it. As the Paris Agreement basically says, Countries, set your targets, and let's measure and, and talk about them. And, but what the action has to happen in the, in the economy, and uh, you don't need a multilateral agreement uh, to try to tackle emissions reductions where they are most important, in the most important countries and the most important industrial sectors. And the new way, this is where trade comes in. A, tra a new kind of trade alliance would identify uh, clusters of key firms and key sectors that emit that agree to remove the... The, the competitive disadvantage argument by agreeing on certain common uh, standards or approaches going forward. And if that's done, you begin to have sort of a sectoral build out of uh, trade understandings in, in the areas that matter. And then secondly, uh, you know, we have all sorts of uh, trade uh, agreements regionally. Why, why, why shouldn't we have a plurilateral, in other words, a, a subset of countries, a link their procurement their uh, financial system disclosure in respect of climate change, 
their tariffs, lower tariffs for green products. Uh, their, their standards for what they consider energy efficient uh, equipment. Uh, what they want to do on, on subsidies. This could form a new type of non-regionally specific uh, kind of trade alliance, trade, trade and economic cooperation alliance that would be a, a big way to advance progress on climate change. But it's a new way of thinking about trade and globalization going forward. Great. Well, this is actually, I think we've answered all the questions uh, in, in even a little bit under one hour, uh, and we know what, uh, what to do now. So uh, thank you so much uh, to, to this panel, and, and thank you to you all, and have a good evening. Thanks.